Hey, Dr. Deb, uh, why don't you read a passage from volume one that you'd like to share with us? Okay. Now, my I have sele pre-selected this because, of course, this was a was a wicked plot from day one. Um, so I knew ahead of time that I was going to do this. And I had a choice as to which which uh, little bit of uh, reading I would select. Why I select this reading is I want to address specially topics that I have found over the years in talking to people uh, that they're either confused about, have the most questions about, or uh, bad information that exists in other magazines uh, and books uh, may have misled them on so that they have a wrong idea. So um, I'm gonna take my glasses off because I can't see with my glasses on. <laughs> you know how that is. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so what makes good confirmation good? So-called good confirmation. What makes good confirmation good? Any structure or combination of structures that enhances the horse's ability to function under a rider contributes to good confirmation. Good confirmation permits a riding horse to perform useful work. The size and proportions of the skeleton on the inside directly determine the size and proportions of the living horse that we see from the outside. A skill amounting to x-ray vision that comes from familiarity with the skeletal structure is what the buyer or judge really needs because the athletic capabilities of the horse are built on structure. Good confirmation permits a riding horse to perform useful work. And because this is true, the relationship between form and function cannot be ignored. The very structure of bone and muscle that determines conformation also creates movement. And it is in movement that any writer should be most interested. What constitutes good conformation is not arbitrary. See, that's why it's not arbitrary. But based on understanding how the horse's musculoskeletal system functions in movement. So as we get into talking about contents in, um, in the pictures from volume one, uh, I want to focus on aspects of equine locomotion that are directly governed by skeletal proportions. And these are, in general, to list them, straight carriage, aptitude for collection, and balance. They gotta go straight, they gotta round up, and when they do that, you're gonna have a horse in balance. Now, you, you're all familiar with, our students are all familiar with Tom Dorrance and Ray Hunt's uh, often repeated uh, mantra, which is field timing and balance. Well, this is, more about balance. Some, you know, feel and timing are more, uh, less on a physical level. Confirmation is all about the physical level. So right. I also want to point out, just in case anybody was worried about it, that I never have it out of the back of my head what the spiritual status of that horse that I'm working with is, uh, how he's feeling, how I'm feeling. You know, uh, you uh, you cannot forget the communication side of this. But so I want to be very clear that the discussion we're now having is a limited discussion. We are focusing on the physical because you can't leave that out either. Right, right. You, you got to have all of it. You got to have the inside parts of the horse. You got to have the outside parts of the horse. So this is more about the outside parts. And, you know, if we go and do other talks later, uh, we'll get into that, Ty, because, uh, because uh, um, I distinctly remember the day Tom taught me this. Painty was getting restive, 
and Tom pulled me over and said, you know, Deb, when a horse is physically uncomfortable, they get mentally uncomfortable. And that, you know, think about that for about five years, every time. You wake up. <laughs> Good old Ray used to say, I go to bed thinking about it and I get up thinking about it. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, wonderful. Well, should I share these images now yeah, and we yeah. can go have a little go visit? Right, go right ahead. I have copies here in case I need to point at something, but I don't know. What are they going to look like when you fly? I don't know. We're going to we're gonna Let's give see. it a go and see. These technological things. Ah, that's a good one. It's okay. loading. Now, that's not the one I wanted to start with. We will We will do that one. I want okay, to start which with one? one with Sadie, uh, that one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is a major area of confusion worldwide. I had a lovely, lovely French gentleman uh, write me a letter back in the day before email, before there was any email, and just compliment me left, right, and up and down the middle. I mean, what a nice letter. And he says, you have explained this so beautifully, you know, so beautifully. <laughs> and, and then he repeated it back to me and it was wrong. <laughs> why? Because he's indoctrinated. Hmm. That's why. Because he has heard the wrong thing throughout his whole education. All these guys, a lot, the teachers overseas uh, in almost every country but the US are, are supposed to be certified. I, I find that absolutely terrifying until we get some correct education. In mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what this guy was confused about is how muscles work. And I find this to be almost a universal uh, problem. Muscles cannot push. Now let's say some horse kicks you. I promise you're going to feel pushed. <laughs> or you may be flying down the driveway after he kicks you in the stomach and you go backwards mighty awful fast. And that's just exactly like the horse had pushed you. Or he crashes into you while you're going through a gate. I, I promise you're going to feel pushed. And it didn't, didn't his musculoskeletal system do that? Of course it did. But that's not how... You, what you're experiencing is an is a compound effect. Muscles have no mechanism for lengthening themselves. So when I say they cannot push, I mean, what does, Emily, you tell me, what does contraction mean? Which way will my fingers, left and right hands? Bring, come towards each other. They have, that's what contraction does. So if there was a muscle attached, between my two hands and the muscle contracted, my hands would move together. Right. Okay, once they have moved together, that's the end of it. That muscle cannot do anything to make this happen. Okay? Right. What makes this happen is some other muscle gotcha. that is attached on the opposite side of whatever joint may be local to that system. Okay. Okay. So let's say you've got your, your, your famous biceps, your, your, uh, your uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger biceps. And you, let's start in neutral with our arm stuck straight out. Okay. If our arm does this, the muscle that is on top is contracting because and it's attached at the top of your forearm bone, your radius, and it's also attached at your shoulder. And it just sits on your humerus, mm -hmm. it sits on your arm. So when this happens, that is because that muscle that's in this space got shorter and it pulled the, the, the lower end of your arm in. So now how am I gonna stick my hand back out? The muscle on the other side yeah. does that. That muscle is attached also to the shoulder blade, but also to the tip of my elbow. 
which sticks out like somewhat like the heel of your foot. Mm -hmm. It's a lever arm. And when that's pulled on, okay, so what, what is this muscle, exper the top muscle, the biceps, what's that experiencing when the triceps contracts? This muscle is experiencing something pulling on it. Okay. And when this one contracts, this one experiences something pulling on it. It takes two to tangle. Okay. These are called appositional couples. Sometimes it's more than two, but uh, almost always it's two. Okay. And they are always on opposite sides of whatever joint is uh, the focus of the system, which in this case would be your elbow joint. Okay. So what this image shows is my old Mercedes, who was a Quay Ram, by the way. And what I've done is I took a photo of her and I made an, uh, tra an outline. That's the body outline you see in the top image. That's the way Sadie was actually standing when I took the picture. But then I oh. manipulated the, the image digitally so as to cause her back to extend, meaning uh, get hollow on top. That's extension of the spine. And I did that as much as I thought you could possibly do it anatomically. So as mm -hmm. to show the most extension uh, that I thought reasonable. And in the bottom image, the opposite. I made her flex the spine so that she kind of humps up in the middle instead of gets hollow. Mm -hmm. Now, the French guy thinks, because uh, obviously the bottom image is what we want our horse to do in collection. Mm -hmm. Okay, The French guy thinks that the muscles of the back do that. Now, the, the muscles of the back are the muscles that are attached on the, this top red band here. Yes. They're attached from the top of the pelvis to the base of the neck, to the declivity or, or this shape that the base, that the neck bones form in front. That muscle is called the longissimus dorsi, and you can read uh, the label right there that's on the image. Mm -hmm. When the longissimus dorsi contracts, what is going to happen? Because it's all above the chain of vertebrae. Ah, that's like, the extended position. Absolutely. <laughs> so all these dressage wags talk about developing the back. They and really need to develop, to develop the develop the back. Well, the, the, you know, you can. Everybody wants that beautiful double back. My my both all of my horses have had that because I was lucky enough to meet some teachers even before I met Ray, who taught me how to produce collection. I knew, I already knew how to ride uh, an upper level horse before I met Ray. And, and that, I'm sure that helped me. Mm -hmm. I, I see people who are dead beginners uh, struggling to understand him. And, I, and it's like, hey, this is like taking guitar lessons from Pepe Romero or taking mathematics lessons from Einstein. Uh, if you have no prior preparation, it's gonna take you longer. Mm -hmm. And the, the little gems of wisdom that the teacher may drop, will probably you'll probably miss them because they have no ground in your being, mm -hmm. not yet. They may later, you know, if you have a good memory, uh, you may be able to kind of play back the tape of whatever clinic you were at even years later and say, oh God, that's what he meant. Now I understand. But anyway, so <laughs> muscles cannot push. Mm -hmm. So if you want that double back, the very first thing you gotta get out of your mind, dump this idea is that you want him to contract the muscle of his back. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing you want to do. Never, ever do anything that causes a horse to tighten its back. That's the, 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 the deep origin of what we call bracing in this school. Mm -hmm. Okay, They can brace anywhere. They can brace a leg. 
they can brace the front part of their neck too, of course. But uh, if their back is braced, honey, I promise you 100%, you're never going to get there from here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how does the horse round up? Where must the muscles, if muscles can only contract, where must they be located to produce that sort of hump, hump in the middle picture that we see in the bottom image? Their abdominal muscles. That's right. Yeah. The, the rectus abdominis is the biggest muscle. That's the one that you see uh, defining the line of the belly. Mm -hmm. There are two others. Uh, that are not visible from the outside. And okay. that, so you kind of have had to maybe study anatomy. Um, and I'm offering that to you right now mm -hmm. because it's right there in the image. It's right there in the picture. And that, that image was in the book from 1986. So it's not like this is news. Yeah. The one is in, in the rear is the iliopsoas complex. Mm-hmm. That underspans the pelvis. The main part of it is not shown in this drawing because the main thickness of that particular muscle, and it's a damn big muscle too, by the way, uh, connects the lower back, the underside of the lower back mm -hmm. to the thigh bone. So that when it contracts, oh, okay. it draws the thigh forward, draws the hind limb forward. Mm -hmm. But there is this uh, part of that that's called the psoas minor, which is still a considerably big muscle that goes from the underside of the lumbar vertebrae to the pelvis. And so that's the tucking the hindquarters abs, underneath. Yes, okay. exactly. Exactly. Okay. So that is loin coiling. Okay. It's to coil the loins. To coil the loins is the first step in collection. Now, the let me define, let me describe collection as a three-part process, and this is something I've been telling audiences and students since the 1970s, because I've known about the ring of muscles since uh, the beginning. Why? Because it's a commonplace in zoology, hmm. and it's unfortunate that it is not taught to veterinarians. Veterinarians, and I'm not a veterinarian. I have a lot of respect for veterinarians. I don't prescribe and I don't diagnose and I don't treat, not by the legal definition of any of those words. So I'm not practicing veterinary medicine without a license. And I have no intention of doing that. So I respect them, but it might help if we had a little respect on the other way. Mm. It is a rare veterinarian, and my my boss at Equus Magazine, Dr. Matthew Mackay Smith, deserves enormous credit here uh, because he was really literate. I don't know what that is, but I'm making it go away. Uh, Matthew was broadly educated. And uh, what and well grounded in zoology, which is unusual, mm -hmm. because and the poor vet, you know, it's like I understand they, they are so busy just treating, you know, fractured paws and distemper and you know what else. Uh, they don't have most of them don't have any time to do research or any outside reading that does not directly relate to what the latest drug is for treating X, Y, or Z. And I don't have to worry about that because I'm not licensed to prescribe drugs. And I have, I know how they work most of the time, but um, I don't have to keep up on the latest in the same way that they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, it would still help if they knew something about the commonplaces of zoology. Because this system that I am showing you in this picture uh, was first mooted for mammals. Uh, it, it applies to all mammals. And the, the earliest publication where it really uh, put it in modern terms was made by a Dutch researcher named Sleiper in the 1940s. 1946. Okay. 
So it's not, this is not news. Gotcha. But it is sure as hell news to lots of horse people. So to make your horse round up, you have to get him to coil the loins, support his back from below by the contraction of the rectus abdominis muscle and raise the base of the neck. Now that is the closing of the ring of muscles because what you're looking at here is the ring of muscles. Okay. Now who gets credit for that? is a German guy named Steinbrecht, who was a veterinarian, but also a student of a fellow named Seeger, Louis Seeger, who was the top cat in 19th century Germany. As a, he was a writing instructor. Well, Steinbrecht wound up marrying Seeger's daughter. So th those antipathies and hatreds which Seeger expressed became the same antipathies and hatreds that Steinbrecht, because it was a family deal. So they, they hated Boshe. Gotcha. Too bad because yeah. they got almost everything right, but they never closed the ring because they didn't listen to Boshe. Mm. Boshe is the one who discovered the base of the neck and discovered what how destructive bracing uh, is. Because if the horse braces any muscle, above the spine, below the spine, I don't care where, uh, but mainly above the spine. If he braces the muscles that overpass the pole that, oh, that are not drawn on this figure, but that uh, invest the upper part of the neck, that go down the long, uh, the length of the back, the longissimus dorsi, or, and at any point, if he braces those, in other words, attempts to extend the spine and not have it just relaxed, how is he going to coil his loins right. if uh, he's in position B? Right, can't. Can't, because he's doing the opposite motion. Right. Now, if you look at ropers, uh, I don't mean ropers in the 1930s or earlier, but starting in about after World War II, uh, everybody started using tie downs. Mm -hmm. What do horses do with a tie down? Every time. Yeah. Don't give me this BS about my horse never, never touches the tie down. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All I have to do, you want to tell me that, I'll get out there with my camera and have you ride your horse. And it will take me about three and a half seconds to catch him on film uh, prying up against that tie. Yeah. This is uh, called isometric exercise. Isometric exercise is when you press your hands out uh, against the door jam in order to uh, prevent you from getting flappers under your arm, <laughs> right? Yeah. To make the triceps fit. So yeah. you're pushing, you're, you're exercising a muscle against an immovable object. It's, it's different than like um, doing curls with dumbbells. Right, right. Those are movable. But if you press on the door jam, well, if you press, if the horse presses up against the tie down, <laughs> what do you think? Developing. <laughs> yeah. Behind your head and pry back. Which which muscles are you turning on? The muscles that are on the back of your neck. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So never use tie downs. It's not only um, irritating to the horse, and uh, which Tom and Ray were telling you. That's why they were telling you not to use tie downs. But it's also stupid. If what you want is to find out what collection actually is, yeah. you will never find it if you tie your horse down with anything. Yeah. But you will find it if you listen to Boche as well as Steinbrecht. So yeah, you gotta you gotta teach him. Steinbrecht understood coiling the loins, and they understood the raising of the center of the back. So I said I was going to describe collection as a three-step process. Collect, mm -hmm. I've been saying this since the 70s. Collection starts from, 
and is always primarily the product of coiling of the loins. Two, collection is continued when said coiling of the loins uh, induces the horse to raise the center of his back. Three, collection is completed when the horse raises the base of the neck. Now, you want to know how collected, how much of this does he have to do before we count it as collected? You could say rounding up and collection are like degrees, because obviously he could round up a little or a little more or quite a damn bit, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, when the base of the neck rises to the same level as the core of the loins, we shall say that he, by definition that he is collected. Now, okay. if your horse is built, now we're back to confirmation. Say you got a quarter horse. There's a 99% chance that your horse is built downhill, meaning that if he's just standing around, you know, snoozing, the core of his loins is inches higher than the base of his neck. That means that to get that sucker collected, you're going to have to be better. You're going to have to, he's going to need to do more, create a, a greater effect. And that's going to take better relaxation and more skill on your part. So the three positions demonstrate the confusion about how muscles work and the story about the French guy. Mm -hmm. Muscles cannot push. They can only contract. So, by the way, is position B an ultimate evil? Are we never to let our horse be in extended position? Don't, I was confused about this myself for a while because that looks so bad. But you know well, what? If you look at enough films, you'll see that horses oscillate. Their back, there is no kind of trot where their back don't go boinga, 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 boinga. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's that elasticity that you're after. So okay. as long as the horse recovers to at least position A, at the end of every stride, he's good. Okay. He's fine. So, because otherwise we'd have to say passage should not be practiced. Ah. Right? Okay. Because in passage, they some horses, uh, longer back horses particularly, uh, make huge. I mean, we say huge, it's really still only about eight degrees. But it feels to the rider like it was an ocean wave. That that dude goes way down and then mm -hmm. he goes way up and then he goes way down. Okay, great big expressive wampa 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 kind of a passage that involves the whole range of motion of the back, which includes the down position, the neutral position, and the up position. Mm -hmm. Other moves, less, uh, you might say, uh, athletically demanding uh, that you would do earlier in training will produce less because okay. the horse is not supple enough and he's not strong enough. You understand. We put a weight on their back. What does that do to their back? What would be the tendency for you set a weight on the horse if he's all relaxed? What's and he does nothing to defend himself against that weight? What's going to happen to his back? He's going to sag, right? Yeah. And so to teach a horse to be a riding horse means what's the very first thing that a riding horse has to learn? To carry the weight of the rider. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. So that's his main job. There, and after that, everything else is a detail. <laughs> if you teach him how to bear your weight and carry it straight and carry it round, you've taught him almost everything he's going to need to know. Okay. Because mm -hmm. now he does it when you ask. Now, if you go back and read Chuck Grant, who is a wonderful old American army officer type of horseman. Chuck Grant took a lot of crap from people because they're dressage snobs. 
at White because Chuck enjoyed Spanish walk as much as he enjoyed passage. Mm -hmm. And he, he loved to show off and he likes to wear the top hat and wave his hand to the crowd. Uh, so do I. So I'm, I'm in his camp. <laughs> and I was there at the Insoco Championships back in the early 1980s when they were held in Kansas City. Had the head finals uh, for, instead of on points, it was an actual competition. And Chuck would be there and he'd have junior riders. He coached all kinds of stuff. And Marisa Dunick, who was his chief protege. Mm -hmm. uh, and they beat the crap out of everybody else, or almost <laughs> everybody. And yet, they, you should have heard the old women up in the stands. Sorry, girls, I don't mean to do that, but that's what they were. Uh, gossiping and whispering because when the junior champion won, she she asked her horse to rear and Spanish walk. Well, you're not supposed to do that. Don't you do that? I have never heard a horse tell me in my ear that he felt he was doing something incorrect <laughs> they're just movements animals make thousands of movements horses have hundreds of gates and and possible movements and they will pull some of those out of the rabbit's hat uh every once in a while now, they also have preferred coordinations, and which is why we can more or less cogently talk about cantering, trotting, walking, or racking. Because, you know, horses kind of like to move in that coordination, but that does not limit them. They, you know, you turn your horse out in the snow sometime and watch. <laughs> Yeah, and they will they will do every canter you could pop, including cross cantering, uh, galope, and and flying changes, because they're playing in the snow. Mm -hmm. Is that wrong? <laughs> no, nope. no, nope, not at all. So dressage is very very indoctrinating, very very limiting, and socially it can be very cruel very ugly you don't need that stuff that's not fun why did we get a horse in the first place because it's a blast <laughs> yeah <laughs> take yeah. an experimental attitude um one of the problems i see people up against is once they've been indoctrinated by dressage and they've been in that world for a while it is very difficult for the it becomes this painful embarrassment to them to try stuff, to ex just go out and try it. I don't care what the horse does. You are not performing at every moment. And you got to get over that feeling that people are watching you because you know why? They are. <laughs> there is no I have not been not watched on horseback since I was in my 20s get over it yeah they're gonna watch and they're gonna gossip because they got their own ideas and that's their problem and not mine <laughs> I'm there to have a good time with my horse and learn something from him and one of the ways to do that or one of the most fun ways to do that is to just let him show me. Let him show me what he knows. Because as Chuck Grant used to point out, you don't need to teach your horse to passage. He already knows how to passage. <laughs> he knows how to do flying changes. He knows how to uh, back up, step back. He knows how to jump. He knows how to do every single one of those things unless he was raised in the back of a stall. Okay, if he's been outside at all with a herd, he will have learned the entire repertory and more. Where do you think the Greeks, the Greek ideal that is so often quoted from Xenophon, which is usually misquoted, but do um, you think the ancient Greeks were out there with a dressage manual <laughs> saying, okay, you got to do this on a 20 meter circle. How far back does dressage go? 1912. Hmm. It has no earlier history. The rule book was mooted 
created in Germany by German officers making up a game for use at the first modern Olympic games in Stockholm that had horses in Stockholm mm -hmm. in 1912. Mm. That's as all that's as far back as it goes. That's as far back as it goes. Ote Cole High School goes back to well before the Romans. Mm -hmm. I have images. Uh, someday I'm going to do a history book because that's another. The history of horsemanship is fascinating. Um, yeah. But there are good images of Romans long reining their horses, riding in passage. There's a wonderful antique. Uh, uh, bas relief of Al supposedly showing Alexander the Great passaging on a Persian trained horse. Oh, Persians, cool. Who we now call Iranians, Iranians, uh, are the inventors of uh, how to do collection. Mm -hmm. And the Turks, south in south where the earthquake was recently, mm -hmm. in south uh, eastern Turkey and northern Iran invented the game of polo, which is where all your sliding stops and your rollbacks come from. Mm -hmm. And that's a war game. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, it is extremely cool. <laughs> but it's, it is, we tend to think we're all Eurocentrists, you know, yeah. it's hard to avoid because that's where our culture mostly comes from. Um, and, and especially equestrian culture and especially literate because the Europeans certainly did write books about how to train horses. And that's what we call the classical, the literature of the classical, so-called classical high school or a classical era. But anyway, do you understand this? With the, with yes. The yeah, this, this has been great. And I think this really, um, the, the image is really, really helpful in understanding. And, and also I can sort of, you know, feel it in my body as you're, as you're talking. Certainly, you have the same muscles. Yeah. Your, your, yeah, your proportions yeah. are weird. Humans yeah. are weird as far as our build. Yeah. Our confirmation is like so off the wall. <laughs> totally not. I mean, to begin with, we walk on our hind legs. And, you know, that's weird. Yeah. So right. this is the this is the part that's not in the old books. That's not in my original uh, book, The Principles of Confirmation Analysis. Uh, because I didn't know it yet. This, <laughs> yeah. this developed in my head as a result of writing with Ray and was later more pretty well confirmed by when I started writing with Tom. So I'm tracking. The Pirellioids call this disengaging the hindquarter. That is so incorrect. <laughs> it's it's breathtakingly incorrect because it is not the, the inventor of this term on tracking is Francois Robichon de la Guerinie, who wrote a book, the, the, the book of books uh, from the 18th century. And it's a, the title is Ecole de Cavalerie. And if you speak French, please forgive my pronunciation, but it's the best I can do. <laughs> uh, I read it, I don't speak it. So, uh, Ecole de Cavalerie is sometimes translated uh, school because an Ecole is a school, school of horsemanship. Uh, that's really not what he meant, I would claim. What it is, is the practice of horsemanship. Okay like a doctor's practice. When does the doctor not be practicing medicine? When everybody's healthy? Yeah, like when is that? Yeah, oh, I got you, okay. So like 24-7, 365 is when he's practicing it. And that's what Ray Hunt means when he says, I go to bed thinking about it and I get up thinking about it. That's the practice of horsemanship. You're practicing all the time because it's like, that important to you right it's right. like incredibly important to you maybe you're a screwball we're all screwballs <laughs> we're all addicts okay but that's hey this is where we are this is our school this is what we do here so if it's gonna matter to you it pretty well better matter so Gary A invented the term untracking 
And it's right there in his books. And he also, but he also says, this is to engage the hindquarter, meaning to bring the inside hind hoof, instead of having that hoof pick up off the ground and be brought forward, not merely brought forward, but also to be brought under the spine. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I compare, think of having a horse out in the bright sunshine in the summer at noon. He would have a shadow directly below him. Mm -hmm. So I often explain this by saying, you want to have the horse, when he is untracking, he's going to step the inside hind hoof under the body shadow. That's okay. what I mean by the body shadow. Okay. So he steps toward the spine or more medially than he would ordinarily do. Now, I say ordinarily. I'm By ordinarily, I mean as if he were just trotting straight, straight down a, a straight line. Okay. And not, not thinking about anything. The rider is not asking him for anything and he's not thinking of turning. He's just going somewhere. Okay. Okay. Untracking is the key to everything. It is the key to, to uh, engagement of the hindquarters because it is the key to straightness. When a horse, now I haven't, I didn't pick out any images of riders sitting crooked or going crooked. But what that means is you can see this at any rodeo. <laughs> Just go watch the warm up. First off, they're all cantering to the left. They never, very rarely do you see anybody canter to the right at the rodeo before the parade or back in the, in the warm up pen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Second, they're all crooked. So you stand at the out gate with your camera and watch the guy, you know, warming up for team roping. He's got one glove on. That's how you know he's a team roper. <laughs> and he's cantering his horse and the horse is okay with it. And he's coming at you directly straight down the track, straight toward you. And his haunches are off 40 degrees to the left. You want to tell me how that is not wearing out the horse's mechanism? <laughs> and, the, and he's blithely, totally, completely unaware of it. What, one of the images, my, one of my favorite images in the book, I was driving my car on a back road not too far from my house one day, and I happened to have my camera with me. And way down the road, like a mile down there, I see this guy coming toward me on a paint horse. And there, there's a lot of guys that breed horses local to me. And they they will hire a college kid to exercise them. So it, Because we don't have a whole lot of traffic on these roads, even though they're paved. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's just walking. And, you know, handsome young guy, dude. And he's just having a, a good time. He's riding a horse. The horse is okay with everything. But... <laughs> So I see this coming, I pull over, I get my camera to turn on and crank up, op open the door and step out into the center of the road and start taking this guy's picture as he comes at me because he's so bloody crooked. Now the horse is walking down the road with all its weight on its right shoulder with its haunches trailing off to the left. And you know, he's sitting, you look at his feet, Whenever a horse is doing that, the rider will also be crooked. Now, one mm. person that I want to credit who helped me enormously at a certain period when I needed it was Sally Swift. Mm -hmm. I actually met her and took a couple of clinics from her. She was real good to me and she cured me absolutely. Yeah, she was what amazing. She was offering, yeah, I, 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 because I, there was a period given my build and my propensities, I absolutely could not sit the trot. Mm -hmm. Bounce and fight and tension and it was all, and damaging my body, it was awful. And she fixed me completely. And after that, I hardly ever post. 
mm-hmm. because sitting is so good is so comfortable mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because but i didn't understand that in order to sit the trot you have to go from left to right not up and down mm-hmm. that's that's the intellectual half of it the other half of it is actually practicing uh following that left right motion that happens at a trot mm-hmm. so however you will find Sally Swift. Sally is dead now, uh, but she left a heritage a school uh, that still offers certification. And although I have no objection, I'm not criticizing because they're all the ones that are certified are teaching the straight stuff. However, they get the, the cart before the horse because their emphasis is on understanding the human skeleton and biomechanical mechanism but most of them know little or nothing about the horse which of the two is bigger (laughs) okay so this animal that's an order of magnitude heavy more massive than you are is going if he is crooked you are going to be crooked unless you're a master rider now when you get to that point you can set independently of any crap that he may be offering. So he wants to go crooked because he's been going crooked for the last 45 years, you know, since since the first guy that ever broke him out. Okay, this horse may be 17 years old by the time you meet him, and he's as crooked as a dog's hind leg. You got to sit as if that was not happening because that is how you draw him to you. Mm-hmm. but the neophyte writer will not be aware of that and will not be able to do it. Yeah. So like this dude who's coming down the road toward me, he just passively, his body just passively conforms to the fact that when the horse has all its weight on its right shoulder, its back will be hollow on the left side, higher on the right uh, seat bone, lower on the left seat bone and so the rider's right foot and leg will be when you take the picture from the front it's inches higher than the one on the left and his shoulders will tilt and his head will tilt the opposite way and then the sally swift instructor comes along and says hey you're sitting crooked correct but it's not because uh you know one of the things they tend to tell people which is wrong is that the woman has an an oblate pelvis. Yeah, you know what? Every woman alive has an oblate pelvis. Did you ever see Bill Dorrance ride? Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, actually I did, yeah. Okay, well- One one clinic, one clinic, yeah. Okay, so you remember he didn't sit square. Yeah. He he did not. And he used, and he's all, he's an old man, he's like, incredibly old man so he has a hump back and his neck sticks out and he's looking he's looking at you you know like this famous bill dorrance look right over his glasses <laughs> he's all screwed up he's had injuries he's been riding since he was two years old you know <laughs> he does not sit perfectly but i never in my life including uh, racehorses, never anywhere have I ever seen a horse as okay and as completely straight as the animals I saw Bill ride. Mm -hmm. So you do not have to sit perfectly. You just have to sit with the right feel. You see, it's not mechanics. Mm That's, it's not, you must, uh, what I'm trying to say is you must not passively follow what the horse is doing, like the, the like the dude on the paint horse. Gotcha, gotcha. Right. So you got to sit square no matter what. Now, when the horse goes crooked, what does he do to go crooked? He untracks. Why is the weight of that horse all on the right shoulder? Because every time he takes a step with his hind legs, he brings his left hind leg across under the body shadow and the right hind leg is paddling on the outside Mm -hmm. okay this works like wind in a sail 
Ah. Whichever hind leg is, is, un, is untracking, is coming up under the body. It's as if wind was blowing diagonally across the horse. Mm -hmm. And that makes, uh, that makes you have a feel in the outside rein. Mm -hmm. So you never take on the outside rein. It's going to get there. It yeah. comes to you. You do not take it to him ever. And that makes, you see the drawing? What the, mm -hmm. the reins are? The right rein is yep. flattened. And the left rein is flat. Ray used to say, never give a horse a square field. And I once hmm. asked him, yeah, what if you had the most perfect horse in the world, Ray? The most perfectly trained horse. You trained it yourself. And it's um it's marvelous. Would you give that horse a square feel? And he sat there so long after I asked that question, I thought I made him mad. <laughs> but no, he's thinking it through. Mm -hmm. he's thinking about every possible angle. And after like three minutes of thinking, I was afraid to breathe. And he finally said, No, Debbie. I don't think I'd give him a square feel even then. <laughs> so there's your answer. When do you give him a square feel? <laughs> Never. 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 Because, why? Because your reins are their feet. And huh. there's a very rare time when their feet are square. Mm -hmm. It can happen momentarily on the flight uh, uh, over a jump, sometimes even on the setup uh, before, b before he thrusts over the fence. Uh, they can be pretty square, but it's rare when they would be square on landing. That's very rare. Mm -hmm. And your hands need to be doing what the legs are doing and telling the legs what to do. Mm -hmm. Your leg, your reins are their legs and their feet. That's what it means to feel the feet. Yeah. yeah. So when a horse goes crooked, he untracks without you having told him to. How do you make him straighten? Let's say you got a horse that always wants to untrack on the left. They all, and they're almost always, it's one side. Why? Yeah. Because when they untrack, they put their weight not only on the right shoulder, they also put it on the right haunch and the right hock. And hock pain is all, near universal in riding horses, especially mm -hmm. American breads, because we breed horses with thin hocks. Hmm. That's a, one across the board. All breeds, all types, all uses my, uh, that I might criticize about American horse breeding. The Europeans, the warm blood breeders, got this straight. Hmm. They're going to show you a, horse, a hawk that's that wide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lipizons and uh, knob strips and Frisians. Wide. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, they're riding horses. Aren't they going to be working off their hocks? Right, right. Why would you want them thin so, and wobbly? And it's very, very common to find that here. And that it has a big inhibitor on your horse's willingness because why? He's going to be having little pains, little twinges in the hocks every time you ask him to do something. Yeah. And that, you know, horses, they will work on a teensy gradient. They don't want to work against pain. Yeah. No. So let's breed one that don't have any pain. Yeah. <laughs> as little as possible. So if they go crooked, they go crooked because they are avoiding putting weight on the left hock. Okay. That's the ultimate reason. And that's exactly what Tom used to say. That most problems that you had with this originated in the hind quarters. That is what he meant. Okay. That's exactly where you go. And any veterinarian will tell you this too, is it, it not that they understand straightness because they don't, but they will have noticed that it's very common for horses to be sore in one hock. That's a common complaint. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so this horse does not want the one in the picture. Uh, if we say he's going crooked or the, the guy on the paint horse, why is, why is the horse doing that? Because he doesn't want to put weight on that hock. Even if it's ounces of difference mm -hmm. he's not going to do it unless right. you tell him to unless you insist that he do so the very thing that causes a horse to go crooked is also the way we 
spelling that he can't go crooked. So let's say your horse likes to untrack only on the left side so that he's waiting his right hock all the time and, uh, and not waiting his left hock equally. What would you do? To square, get him to go square? I'd get him to go square using my uh, left leg. No. To, no. no. Okay. What's, gonna, what's, gonna, what's happening there already in the picture? This is a rider who means to be doing a shoulder in or a leg yield. And he means to be going left to right in the image. But let pretend that, that that's not the case. That he's not being, the horse is not being asked to do that. He's just doing it. Yeah. He's volunteering it. And he only does that. So that if you try to get him to canter to the right, he's never shaped up to go to the right. He's shaped yeah. up to go to the left all the time. So he never gets his right lead. Right? Right. I can see left, that. He's yes. shaped up to take a, a left lead. Yes. He's not shaped up to take a right lead. And unless he can do what? What is he going to have to do that you can see in that left hand image to get himself ready to go to the right? He's going to have to bend to the right and right. move his rib cage over. Yeah. He's going to have okay. to change sides. Okay. And how do they change sides? What is creating that arc in the spine? The untracking of oh, the hind leg. The head bent to the left. No, it doesn't start from the head. The head is the end of the pole. Okay. The head is just the end of the of the fishing pole. Well, his hind quarters are crooked. No, they're not crooked. He's untracking. Okay. Okay. So he, uh, if he untracks with the left hind leg, he arcs his body to the as for a left hand circle. Yes, I see so you that. get him to arc his body as for a right hand circle. Yeah, I bend him to the bend, ten, bend to the. I mean, bend to the right. He has to bend to change the right. The, change what the bend. What creates the bend? What creates the bend? If he reaching the reaching the right leg up underneath. Hey! Okay. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> right now. I want you to go out and practice this, Emily, okay. tonight before you feed your horses. Okay. Okay. Let's say you're, uh, you make a circle, walk on a circle, and deliberately untrack with your left hind leg. You will okay. find that your spine just wants to make like a ballet dancer and do this and arc to the left. Then go straight two steps and start untracking on your right hind leg. What okay. happens to the bend in your spine then? Changes the other direction. It goes the other direction. Okay. Circles are made by untracking. The reins have nothing to do with it. The okay. Are there to receive? Okay. And to conceivably, uh, kind of later on, perhaps to uh, to shape in the sense that you are telling the horse to distribute its uh, the flow of its weight and energy mm -hmm. in in some particular way that you desire okay but you are not turning like a five-year-old by pulling on the reins right That's for pony clubbers who are honking around in a in a line on <laughs> ponies that are asleep in their brain that's for absolute beginners, and it's fine for them. Right. But you, right. we're not talking about that here, are we? We're talking no. about passage. Yeah. We're talking yeah. about flying changes. We're talking about cutting figure eights correctly. So when you ride a figure eight at a walk or a trot, you're going to go, let's say you're trotting, so you go plunk, 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 plunk. Well, what are you asking each step? You're asking him to continue to untrack with the left hand okay. leg. When you approach X, you change your request so that you are now asking him, you give him a warning about two steps, two strides. And you'd say, honey, you want to change? I want you now to untrack with your right hind leg. And the horse will, if he's kind of been through this a while, he'll readily Go, he'll go from the left bend and go whoomp, just like the wind came across the back of the boat and the sail comes over to the other side. 
He inflates on the outside because that's where the wind is pushing him. And mm -hmm. the wind comes from the thrust of the hindquarters, which is to say each individual leg. Mm -hmm. He has to go step, 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 step and back, doesn't he? Yes. He's not going bang, bang, bang like a rabbit. Right. <laughs> so Let's hope not. Left, it's the left hind leg and then it's the right hind leg. So you yeah. manipulate his untracking to cure him from untracking willy nilly, mm -hmm. which is what it means to go crooked. Mm -hmm. You get control of his hind quarters and thereby of his the arc in his back and ultimately in his neck. Mm -hmm. And that's what contact is. Mm -hmm. Because it comes from the back and winds up in your hands. You don't take it. He offers it to you. He extends it to you. Literally extends it. And we'll talk about that. That's the business about raising the base of the neck. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a later conversation. So yeah. straightness, ha the final point, straightness has to be there before we can have that three position gig mm -hmm. that we looked at before. If their body is crooked, when you ask them to round up, you'll have I'm to shove happen. them to get them to round up because yeah. you're grinding the gears. It's like having a, a freight car on a, a crooked on the tracks. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. grinding the wheels against the track. You're throwing sparks. You're ruining your equipment. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if he is uh, supple, meaning that he can change from one arc, left arc to right arc, arc. Uh, you know, I go through this whole complicated explanation with the picture here. You know what Tom used to say? People would say, you know, what does this mean? When is a horse straight, Tom? And he would say, uh, the horse is straight when it didn't matter to him whether he worked to the right or he worked to the left right because he's <laughs> equally comfortable right right now i'm i'm gonna finish this by telling you a funny story okay. um i was coaching these two gals and they they uh the one had borrowed a horse off the other one and the horse that was borrowed was a tracaner that had been given to the first gal that owned the horse um because it just didn't uh, work out as a competitor, right? And it's kind of off all the time, not not dead lame, but just kind of wonky, you know, kind mm -hmm. of one level in the way it moves. That's extremely diagnostic of crookedness. It's exactly <laughs> how it manifests. I mean, uh, there are a million other things that crookedness does bad mm -hmm. uh, to a horse's ability to perform, but that's a very common uh, thing you will notice. So. Uh, the more skillful of the two gals is she's a professional horsewoman and she's really very skillful, but was not aware of this straightness business. So mm -hmm. I showed her that and I taught her to uh, how to get the horse to change which hind leg it was uh, untracking with. Mm -hmm. And to and we went through some slow uh, uh, repeats of figure eights at a walk. To getting the horse more and more loose, getting it to change from one spinal arc to the other. And it was working out great and the horse comes straight. So I said, okay, um, now I got to coach this other gal and I'm going to turn my back on you for a minute because I got to pay attention to her. So go right ahead and ride him. But please remember, no more than 50 steps. <laughs> Well, you know, this is a pretty good horse, really. And it feels wonderful when a horse collects and moves freely and yeah. with full elasticity, because that's what's going to happen the moment he goes straight. The moment he goes straight, everything is easy. Collection is the gift of straightness. It's the result of straightness. Straightness is merely one dimension of the three-dimensional phenomenon, which collection is. 
Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's uh, it's it's the up down dimension that we're looking at when we look at Sadie going up and down with her back, and it's the side to side dimension that we're looking at when we look at the skeletal pictures that we just examined. Mm -hmm. So I turn my back and I'm coaching the the you know the other gal, and it's like I trust I trust the girl I just said no more than fifty steps. I trusted her foolishly. <laughs> because she got tempted and you know harry whitney talks about this about getting tempted because tom used to say to me debbie i want you to remember painty has all has already been called on it, by other people and mm -hmm. that's what got him to be in nuts he was nuts because uh is a tremendously athletic horse and it's just like wow when you're riding him and you just want more and more and you forgot he's got to breathe all right <laughs> he he needs a break yeah yeah but you forget because you get tempted so i'm coaching the other gal and my back is turned and all of a sudden i hear this noise which is only the same noise that you the only one thing that that noise could be from and that is a horse busting in half bucking and i turn around and here's the gal um she's a pretty good rider so she stayed on but he and the horse had just said forget it i'm not doing this why why how many years has that horse been only supporting himself or mainly mm -hmm. locomoting off the right hock mm -hmm. okay what's it got to feel like when you suddenly ask him to take equal weight on both well he's getting twinges in the left hock yeah it's not yeah all that comfortable at first you have to give this a little bit a little dabble do ya all right yeah right so you keep it below you always keep it below where it's going to get the horse uncomfortable and you have to be able to feel where that is so i said no more than 50 steps and she she and she laughed we both laughed <laughs> because she knew she got tempted and 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 that's what caused the problem it was not the horse it was her. yeah but it is a good, it's a funny story, but it's a good illustration of how this works. Now, the fact that you, Emily, have been taking clinics for X, the, yay, these many years, and you still find this difficult is exactly what's going to be happen with, with, happening with people who watch this tape. It's a, they're going to be no, in no better shape than you are <laughs> because despite the fact that this is exactly what ray was saying and what buck says and what harry says and what josh, josh nichols says and tom Curtin and all the other good guys and women who teach this i don't know of any of them who put it this way or whose uh, whose clinics always as mine do contain a classroom segment which is an actual and it's because i'm a school mom okay mm -hmm. I don't start colts for the public. I start my own colts and I don't train horses for the public. So I have a different balance mm -hmm. than, than other teachers. And I think it takes all of us to come close to even approximate what Tom had. Mm -hmm. Right. So we all have our little piece of it and we're all teaching the best we can with what that piece that we own uh, is. And that's what's, it will always have to be that way. Yeah, that was perfect. That was a, a perfect uh, way to, to wrap up that conversation with a bow. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm.